Get ready. Hi, my name is Kaz Riley, and this is the Hypnosis 247 Live Network, and this is Trancing in the Sheets. And before I go over to a wonderful, wonderful lady I have for you today, just to remind you that when you signed up for the network, you were sent a $200 uh, hotel gift card that you need to go and activate. So don't forget to go and activate that hotel uh, gift card. And also, if you'd like to learn how using travel incentives, even things like cruises, vacation, holidays, or just hotels, can really enhance your business, then just put the word solutions in the box below, and we'll send you out some information. And also, if you, you do that and you want it to stop, just put in stop to any of the messages that we send you. So today, trancing in, in the sheets with me, I have the very wonderful Dr. Sophie Newton. She is uh, well known on the internet, on YouTube with Dr. Sophie's Lifestyle Medicine, I believe, and yeah. um, talks about all kinds of things. Here I am in the British countryside, and I want to talk to you about a lifestyle medicine. She's one of the most researched people I know. So uh, welcome, Dr. Sophie, uh, this morning. Thank you very much. So um, the reason we're, we're, we're chatting today, or our topic today, is that whenever I see anybody, they come and see me with sexual dysfunction, the first question I ask them is, have you been to see your doctor? And um, sometimes people have. Often people haven't or they're worried about going to see their, see their doctor when they're experiencing sexual problems. Um, so especially for ladies, I think, I think they're often very shy and quiet about, about sex and about how they're feeling. So what should somebody expect when they come and see you and uh, they walk into your doctor's office and, and start to, what kinds of things are you seeing and what kind of questions and tests do they, do they have? Yeah, well, just to explain, I'm a GP registrar. So, yeah, working primary care here uh, in Yorkshire. And um, it's surprisingly common to get probably people, everyone who seems to come in and talk about it thinks that they're probably the only one who comes in and talks about yeah. it. And often the first thing they will say, I can almost tell from their face, um, no. is that, oh, sorry, pause, is that um, they come in a bit shyly and they sit down and say, oh gosh this is really embarrassing oh I don't even know I'm so embarrassed to be here I'm probably wasting your appointment and um I say uh, absolutely not I whatever you're going to say there's absolutely no need for you to be embarrassed um we see everything here and hear everything here and obviously it's confidential um within the healthcare team so there's really no need to be worried or anxious about telling your doctor things um, so that's probably the first thing I say. And almost as soon as I say that, people kind of go, oh, OK. And they kind of like go, right, this is good. And in fact, sometimes somebody's coming for something else and I might ask them on how is this affecting your intimacy with your partner? And sometimes people kind of seem really surprised that I've even asked that question and then say, mm -hmm. well, actually, it is affecting it, but I've never spoken to anyone about it before. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, let's talk about it. Um, so not to, so the first point I definitely think is don't be embarrassed and don't be afraid to talk to your doctor about it. You might, if you're, you know, for a woman, you might prefer to go and see a female GP. Often that's the way. Um, but, but in general, don't be nervous. So the key things I need to find out in that consultation um, is, is there a physical cause for whatever the sexual problem is or is it a psychosexual problem? Um, so it's really important for me to ask some questions to find out what the problem might be. And also the first thing would be, is it a libido problem or is it a physical kind of pain problem? Usually that's the, the two issues we're dealing with. Um, a libido problem might be something to do with that medication. We know, for example, many people are on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. They can affect your libido and can affect orgasm and things like that. Um, but if, if it's a physical problem, 
is it is it a pain problem is it an actual fact that there's an an element of what we call vaginismus which means that the kind of vaginal canal isn't really opening so it's almost impossible to have penetrative intercourse um and if, if there is pain then we're going to ask questions because what we need to find out is is it kind of a superficial pain which often might be caused by something like an infection so that could be really easy to fix mm -hmm. um it could be something uh like if it's if a woman has been menopausal there could be an element of thinning of the vaginal the canal which makes it painful and sometimes dry as well and again mm -hmm. that can usually be pretty easily fixed with vaginal lubricants or a bit of hrt a hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. um could be just skin problems so that's the kind of thing we need to ask about <clears throat> sometimes we need to examine but if we don't need to examine then we'll try not to but mm -hmm. if for example it might be a skin problem then we're probably going to need to have a look um if there is deep pain um usually that is caused by um endometriosis but it could be also pelvic inflammatory disease so as well in amongst asking about the questions of the history so is it painful is it the libido we're going to also need to ask some intimate questions about sexual history mm -hmm. so again i would just say don't be embarrassed you know no one is judging you so the best thing to be is honest mm -hmm. um and sometimes that can bring up quite painful things for the patient to discuss, which they may not want to discuss straight away, which is also completely fine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think be prepared to be as open as you feel able to be uh, with the doctor. And that obviously we're going to have to ask quite a few questions, but we'll try not, you know, and only examine if we have to. In, in certain, certainly within vaginismus, the last thing that anybody a woman would want would be to be examined so yeah. we're very aware of that and you know generally we wouldn't need to anyway yeah um and then depending on what we found for those answers um will be according to whatever the next steps were if i was quite happy that we've ruled out a physical cause then we'd be thinking about how we're going to treat this from a counseling and education and mm. therapy point of view <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if there's a physical cause, then probably we're going to be either treating it as infection or referring to gynecology for some further investigations. Yeah. I guess the, 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 the thing that I always try and express to my clients is that when, when they go and see the doctor, you know, they're, then they'll be sent down the right track. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's very easy to assume that um, sexual dysfunction is on the mind or, or that the you know that if they're experiencing pain that that pain will always be there and sometimes there there is um you know a physical cause that's causing that pain it's not just that things have tightened up sometimes there's you know that just maybe just a bit of sensitivity or I had um, a lady recently got some is it psoriasis um, mm. you know the in a vulva and you know sometimes it is just a mild infection and people worry about the word infection but sometimes that can just be Something like a yeast infection, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's probably the most common well. infection which causes pain. Yeah, yeah. And, and often it stays there for a long time and, and people just don't know until it, get, it gets irritated. And I think, especially for ladies, we, you know, women are still taught, we're still taught that we're not supposed to like sex. So, you know, it's, it's only, it was only in the late 1990s, in the late sort of 1990s that even... A classification for female sexual sexual dysfunction was even introduced wasn't it so you know it's still we're still learning I think to be able to talk about these things and to say it hurts or I'm not really wanting it but I used to and I would like to feel you know that to like to feel my libido again or whatever it may be so I think as women we're just kind of getting comfortable with that now or even starting to Whereas before, you know, it was just like, well, that's what happens and women don't want sex, which of course isn't true, is it? No. And I find, especially with older women, that, you know, I have, um, had a 70, 70 year old woman come in this week, actually, who was been widowed for 10 years and has got a new partner mm -hmm. um, and but is finding sex painful. And she was so embarrassed to tell me that she's, that she's having sex with this new partner. But, because uh, why shouldn't she be? <laughs> Absolutely. And that, you know, great. I'm pleased you found someone and you're happy. Let's, let's figure this out so you can enjoy it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is it. You know, your, your, your 
sexuality doesn't disappear with age. It doesn't disappear with menopause or any of the things that kind of traditionally we might we might have um you know we were kind of been taught aren't we you know for women especially where that oh well you know we wouldn't want that to the point where i have women coming in here sometimes that have a high libido and feel embarrassed because they've got a high libido so it's it can work both ways can't it that you know just as with men with women there's a whole range of things it's when something changes suddenly that or a new relationship and you know, I hope I'm having sex when I'm in my seventies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, what when when somebody comes in to see you, or they go and see their own doctor, you know, what what would what would be the they kind of need to be sent down a particular track? So, I guess there'd be lots of in, investigations or possible investigations. What about things like menopause? Where would you start if you know somebody? Because we now know there'll be changes in libido for example when somebody goes into menopause but that doesn't nec- that doesn't mean that their libido should go away and it doesn't mean that they don't want sex anymore and that that and for some women because you see lots of women who have been in a relationship for 25 years they go through the menopause and they think they've lost their libido then they meet somebody new and lo and behold the libido's back again but there's been no change in their hormones from when they they didn't didn't and, and did have it so what what kind what can somebody really expect say um, through the menopause in terms of how their uh, libido and their sexual activity might change? Yeah, well, I do definitely find that women complain about their libido is reduced, but I think that is often comes hand in hand with the fact that they you tend to get vaginal dryness because you the estrogen is reduced and it's the estrogen which keeps the the skin within the vaginal canal lubricated and quite kind of plumped and mm-hmm. um, so once you're lacking that estrogen it thins out and it can become a bit dry and painful so women kind of say I've kind of given up because it wasn't they weren't enjoying it anymore yeah. and hence the libido goes down because they're no longer wanting it because it was not longer enjoyable so often it comes hand in hand um, so then I would ask about other menopausal symptoms because mm-hmm. if they are having lots of hot flushes that are also bothering them um, low mood weight increase skin dryness then we're going to then we're going to be thinking about hormone replacement therapy, mm-hmm. um, which if they've got all those other symptoms going on, probably they might want to take um, systemic. So for example, a, a tablet or a patch. Um, and that usually sorts everything out. Some women can't have HRT, but if they've got other health concerns, but if they can, then it's usually a good solution. Uh, we used to be quite afraid of HRT. There was uh, quite a lot of bad press a few years ago, but we're now learning as long as there's not, Um, some certain contraindications such as breast Mm -hmm. cancer then for most women it's really safe and can really be life changing actually but the other option would just be um a topical hrt which would be a form of estrogen cream Mm -hmm. or pessaries that they can literally put in the vagina to help prevent that dryness and that thinness to help them enjoy sex again really Mm -hmm. and then maybe their libido will come back a bit as well well it's very true i know um, working with some of the clients that I have here, it's that good experience feeds back into libido. So the more you do something that you enjoy, the more you will want it. Whereas if something changes and it doesn't feel good anymore, um, then that that it stands to reason that you you get to a point where you you don't particularly want that. But often that's about communication as well, isn't it, with their partner in being able to kind of say that this isn't feeling good anymore or you know, just in the way that when you think about where we might, the way we might have sex when we're in our thirties or forties to when we first become sexually active is very different. So it stands to reason that how we do it actually in our fifties, sixties, seventies will be very different to how we might have done it prior to the menopause. It may be, you know, because our bodies change, they respond in different ways. So a lot of that I suspect is about having the confidence to talk to a partner about what what women need and what they don't and how that's changed pre and post menopause as well so I think sometimes it's about that isn't it as well mm. um it's not always about you know i think sex quite often gets lobbed into this kind of bit of about penetration and actually it's much more than that isn't it so occasionally it's intimacy intimacy with absolutely. your partner yeah and uh, of course, sometimes people, if they feel like they can't be penetrated, then what they start to do is avoid intimacy. 
And then that can lead to other things as well, like depression and anxiety and all kinds of other things as well, isn't it? Which is oh. often communication issues. So antidepressants is a big one. You know, lots of antidepressants um, are extremely useful in helping people overcome depression. But one of the side effects, isn't it, is that it can have an effect on libido and connection. And, you know, there's lots of studies that support that now. One of the questions that I get asked from um, therapists, actually, who have clients with anti who are on antidepressants but have libido problems <coughs> Is there, you know, is there anything that can be done to help those clients? Is there anything that you can do as a doctor to help those clients that are taking antidepressants and the antidepressants we know are causing the libido issue rather than the underlying depression or anxiety itself? Yeah, well, depending on which uh, medication they're on, we could try and lower the dose mm -hmm. to see if that still helps them with the mood but prevents some of the side effects we can review whether they still need to be on the antidepressants. So typically we try and keep someone on it for six months after they felt well better. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be time to see if it, someone could come off it. Um, or alternatively, often when someone's starting on an antidepressant, if someone's mood is very low, if they're kind of moderately or even severely depressed, they're not going to be wanting to have sex anyway. So sometimes mm -hmm. I say to people, look, this is a side effect, but Perhaps the offset is by lifting your mood, you know, it might be a balance because you're feeling a bit happier. You're probably a bit more likely to be interested in sex anyway. So it depends on the person and it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, there, there isn't any other kind of medication I can offer to kind of counteract the low libido. So it's just a case of, do you need to be on the antidepressant? Can we lower the dose? Can we think of anything else to help your libido? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I suspect for a lot, for a lot of people, one of the reasons that do you find that sometimes people that come in with a low libido that can often lead to a diagnosis of, of depression, you know, that may be the symptom that they, that they, there's a kind of, sometimes I think people can have a very low mood for a long time and then they lose interest in sex and then it's their partner because their partners kind of then starts to feeling that they often then kind of instigate that, that somebody could go and see their doctor. Do you ever find that that sometimes is the presenting um, the symptom of depression sometimes? Yeah, often actually, interestingly, um, sometimes for a patient, for example, who might have rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. and they come in and they, they're a bit down and I think I'm scratching the surface. And I think I'm not getting to whatever the key problem is here. And I know they're unhappy and they've got problems with their joints. And then sometimes I might say, for example, and how is this, is this affecting intimacy with your partner? And they kind of, their face changes and they're like, yeah, well, actually that is the problem. And, and, um, and it's getting me down. And, but, and then that undercovers, yeah, they might have low mood issues, but mm. so sometimes it's not something we necessarily always think about. Um, as even as doctors, actually, that we should not forget and ask about that. But, often low mood and yeah sexual dysfunction definitely go hand in hand and sometimes it might appear in situations where unless you specifically ask about it you won't find out mm. and well that's the thing isn't it and it's a subject that um is often a taboo subject isn't it because problems even just pain or um physical pain or um whatever it may be for both men and women, actually, if they've got something like rheumatoid arthritis or even osteoarthritis, if you've got a really painful back, then, you know, being sexually active with your partner can be, can be an issue, can't it? And, mm. um, you know, if there's anything, you know, it's something that uh, it's one of the subjects that we're going to pick up, pick up with um, uh, somebody else um, later in this series is about, you know, um, kind of intimacy during terminal illness, things like that, where people often assume that that won't happen, but actually it's probably even more essential, isn't it? You know? Yeah, well, I used to work in the local hospice. And when I remember one time there was a man in his late 40s and um, his, we were speaking to him and his wife was there and he said, oh, I feel so much better. I had a, had a uh, jump in the little jacuzzi earlier. Uh, it's a shame you weren't there and he was kind of joking he went it's a shame you weren't there really and gave her a little wink and we said would you like to, to some time alone would you and he he kind of went oh I was just joking and we said yeah but so he's in the hospice he's terminally ill but he's yeah. and we said just because you're ill you're still husband and wife you still want intimate time together so they went from kind of joking 
thing and they just said actually that would be fabulous so we arranged them to have this time when they were going to be completely undisturbed and they could have some intimate time together yeah. Yeah. and it was really fabulous and they were really grateful because you wouldn't you know it's not typically you think of something doing but we should <laughs> uh, well absolutely you know it's it, and and actually I think at that at that point in somebody's life you know if they've never got terminal illness or you know that's the very time that you would think you know we would want to feel that intimacy and connection which you know in some cases will be sexual but in others isn't even that you know it's that it, it's one of those things isn't it where you know it's the things that can make you feel good and we know that you know that kind of intimacy with a partner makes people feel good sex makes you feel good so anything that helps in that situation is surely a good thing and um you know and i can actually make people feel really alive actually isn't it yeah. that's the thing you know it's i'm not that. just a patient yeah. i am not just a patient who has cancer i am still a husband of absolutely you know. so i'm sure that's something that we can uh, have a talk about um <laughs> in a in a in a later episode but where 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 can people find you if they uh if they want to watch your amazing youtube channel or instagram channel where, where yeah can find so my my focus isn't about sexual health my focus is lifestyle medicine yes. which is essentially looking at any kind of non-drug treatment for um for, for health problems so you can find me at dr sophie's lifestyle medicine on youtube and instagram so that's my handle dr sophie's lifestyle medicine wonderful and of course all the things that you talk about on there so things like mindfulness nutrition fasting of course, all of that feeds into somebody's sexual health because, you know, we to have a good libido and stuff, we need to be, you know, with the, the healthier that we can be and the better we feel about ourselves, that all Definitely. feeds into that as well. So it's it's not directly linked, but it's all relevant. So, yeah. you know, it's, uh, and, and they're great, great, great videos. And of course, you know, the people across the world can watch, see a bit of our wonderful, beautiful Yorkshire country. Yes, indeed. As they're watching that as well. So... Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I know you're most uh, welcome. Um, and um, I'm, I'm hoping you'll come back and talk to us some more about some other things at a later date, which sure. um, will do. Um, cause your knowledge, you're so researched. You're one of the most researched people I've ever come across, I think. So oh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, we always get the right information. So um, this is being Transing in the Sheets with the wonderful Dr. Sophie Newton. And um, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then don't forget to tune in to Sean Michael Andrews, the world's fastest hypnotist. Um, he has lots of interesting um, and amazing guests looking at hypnosis right across the, board, across the board, especially with entertainment. So do give him a check out and all of the other hosts that we have here on the Hypnosis 247 Live Network. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Get ready.